This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arctra. A Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter 17 Wherein Mrs. Comstock Dances in the Moonlight, and Elnora Makes a Confession. Billy was swinging in the hammock, at peace with himself and all the world, when he thought he heard something. He sat bolt upright, his eyes staring. Once he opened his lips, then thought again and closed them. The sound persisted. Billy vaulted the fence and ran down the road with his queer sideways hop. When he neared the Comstock cabin, he left the warm dust of the highway and stepped softly at slower pace over the rank grass of the roadside. He had heard aright. The violin was in the grape arbor, singing a perfect jumble of everything, poured out in an exultant tumult. The strings were voicing the joy of a happy girl heart. Billy climbed the fence enclosing the west woods and crept toward the arbor. He was not a spy and not a sneak. He merely wanted to satisfy his child heart as to whether Mrs. Comstock was at home, and Elnora at last playing her love violin with her mother's consent. One peep sufficed. Mrs. Comstock sat in the moonlight, her head leaning against the arbor. On her face was a look of perfect peace and contentment. As he stared at her, the bow hesitated a second, and Mrs. Comstock spoke. It's all very melodious and sweet, she said, but I do wish you could play Money Musk and some of the tunes I danced as a girl. Elnora had been carefully avoiding every note that might be reminiscent of her father. At the word she laughed softly and began, Turkey in a Straw. An instant later Mrs. Comstock was dancing in the moonlight. Ammon sprang to her side, caught her in his arms. While to Elnora's laughter and the violence and petis they danced until they dropped panting on the arbor bench. Billy scarcely knew when he reached the road. His light feet barely touched the soft way, so swiftly he flew. He vaulted the fence and burst into the house. Aunt Margaret! Uncle Wesley! he screamed. Listen! Listen! She's playing it! Elnor's playing her violin at home, and Aunt Kate is dancing like anything before the arbor. I saw her in the moonlight. I ran down. Oh, Aunt Margaret! Billy fled sobbing to Margaret's breast. Why, Billy, she chided, don't cry, you little dunce. That's what we've all prayed for these many years. You must be mistaken about Kate. I can't believe it. Billy lifted his head. Well, you just have to, he said. When I say I saw anything, Uncle Wesley knows I did. The city man was dancing with her. They danced together, and Elnora laughed. But it didn't look funny to me. I was scared. Who was it said wonders never cease? asked Wesley. You mark my word. Once you get Kate Comstock started, you can't stop her. There's a wagon load of penned up force in her, dancing in the moonlight. Well, I'll be hanged. Billy was at his side instantly. Whoever does it will have to hang me, too, he cried. Sinton threw his arm around Billy and drew him closely. Tell us all about it, son, he said. Billy told. And when Elnora just stopped a breath, can't you play some of the old things I knew when I was a girl? said her ma. Then Elnora began to do a thing that made you want to whirl round and round, and quicker and scat there was her ma whirling. The city man he ups and grabs her and whirls too, and back in the woods I was going just like they did. Elnora begins to laugh, and I ran to tell you, cause I knew you'd like to know. Now all the world is right, ain't it? ended Billy in supreme satisfaction. "'You just bet it is,' said Wesley. Billy looked steadily at Margaret. "'Is it, Aunt Margaret?' 
Margaret Sinton smiled at him bravely. An hour later, when Billy was ready to climb the stairs to his room, he went to Margaret to say good night. He leaned against her an instant, then brought his lips to her ear. "'Wish I could get your little girls back for you,' he whispered, and dashed towards the stairs. Down in the Comstock cabin the violin played on, till Nora was so tired she scarcely could lift the bow. Then Philip went home. The woman walked the gate with him, and stood watching him from sight. "'That's what I call one decent young man,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'To see him fit in with us, you'd think he'd been brought up in a cabin, but it's likely he's always had the very cream of the pot. "'Yes, I think so,' laughed Elnora. "'But it hasn't hurt him. "'I've never seen anything I could criticize. "'He's teaching me so much, unconsciously. "'You know he graduated from Harvard and has several degrees in law. "'He's coming in the morning, "'and we are going to put in a big day in the Katosala. "'Which is? "'Those grey moths with wings that fold back like big flies, "'and they appear as if they had been carved from old wood.' Then, when they fly, the lower wings flash out, and they are red and black, or gold and black, or pink and black, or dozens of bright, beautiful colors combined with black. No one has ever classified all of them and written their complete history, unless the bird woman is doing it now. She wants everything she can get about them. I remember, said Mrs. Comstock, they are mighty pretty things. I've started up slews of them from the vines covering the logs all my life. I must be cautious and catch them after this, but they seem powerful spry. I might get hold of something rare. She thought intently and added, And wouldn't know it if I did. It would just be my luck. I've had the rarest thing on earth and reached this many a day, and only had the wit to cinch it just as it was going. All that I don't let anything else escape me. Next morning Philip came early, and he and Elnora went at once to the fields and woods. Mrs. Comstock had come to believe so implicitly in him that she now stayed at home to complete the work before she joined them, and when she did she often sat sewing, leaving them wandering hours at a time. It was noon before she finished, and then she packed a basket of lunch. She found Elnora and Philip near the violet patch, which was still in its prime. They all lunched together in the shade of a wild crab thicket, with flowers spread at their feet, and the wild orioles streaked the air with flashes of light and trailing ecstasy behind them, while the red wings, as always, asked the most impertinent questions. Then Mrs. Comstock carried the basket back to the cabin, and Philip and Elnora sat on a log, resting a few minutes. They had unexpected luck, and both were eager to continue the search. "'Do you remember your promise about those violets?' asked he. "'Tomorrow is Edith's birthday, and if I'd put them special delivery on the morning train, she'd get them in the late afternoon. They ought to keep that long. She leaves for the north next day.' "'Of course you may have them,' said Elnora. "'We will quit long enough before supper to gather a large bunch. They can be packed so they will carry all right. They should be perfectly fresh.' "'especially if we gather them this evening and let them drink all night.' "'Then they went back to hunt Katosala. "'It was a long and a happy search. "'It led them into new, unexplored nooks of the woods, "'past a red pole nest, "'and where goldfinches prospected for thistledown "'for the cradles they would line a little later. "'It led them into real forest, "'where deep, dark pools lay, where the hermit thrush and the wood robin extract the essence from all other bird melody and pour it out in their pure bell tone notes. It seemed as if every old grey tree trunk, slab of loose bark, and prostrate log yielded the flashing grey treasures, while of all others they seemed to take alarm most easily and be most difficult to capture. Philip came to Elnora at dusk, daintily holding one by the body, its dark wings showing and its long, slender legs trying to clasp his fingers and creep from his hold. "'Oh, for mercy's sake!' 
cried Elnora, staring at him. I half believe it, exulted Amon. Did you ever see one? Only in collections, and very seldom there. Elnora studied the black wings intently. I surely believe that's Sappho, she marveled. The bird woman will be overjoyed. We must get the cyanide jar quickly, said Philip. I wouldn't lose her for anything. Such a chase as she led me. Elnora brought the jar and began gathering up paraphernalia. When you make a find like that, she said, it's the right time to quit and feel glorious all the rest of the day. I tell you I'm proud. We will go now. We have barely time to carry out our plans before supper. Won't Mother be pleased to see that we have a rare one? I like to see any one more pleased than I am, said Philip Ammon. I feel as if I'd earned my supper tonight. Let's go. He took the greater part of the load and stepped aside for Elnora to precede him. She followed the path, broken by the grazing cattle. Toward the cabin and nearest the violet patch she stopped, laid down her net and the thing she carried. Philip passed her and hurried straight toward the back gate. "'Aren't you going to?' began Elnora. "'I'm going to get this moth home in a hurry,' he said. "'This cyanide has lost its strength, and it's not working well. We need some fresh in the jar.' He had forgotten the violets. Elnora stood looking after him, a curious expression on her face. One second so, she picked up the net and followed. At the blue bordered pool she paused and half turned back. Then she closed her lips firmly and went on. It was nine o'clock when Philip said good-bye and started to town. His gay whistle floated to them from the farthest corner of the Limberlost. Elnora complained of being tired, so she went to her room and to bed. But sleep would not come. The thought was racing in her brain, and the longer she lay, the wider awake she grew. At last she softly slipped from bed, lighted her lamp, and began opening boxes. Then she went to work. Two hours later, a beautiful birch-bark basket, strongly and artistically made, stood on her table. She set a tiny alarm clock at three, returned to bed, and fell asleep instantly, with a smile on her lips. She was on the floor with the first tinkle of the alarm, and hastily dressing, she picked up the basket and a box to fit it, crept down the stairs, and out to the violet patch. She was in afraid as it was growing light, and lining the basket with damp mosses, she swiftly began picking, with practiced hands, the best of the flowers. She scarcely could tell which were freshest at times, but day soon came creeping over the limberlost and peeped at her. The robins woke all their neighbors, and a babel of bird notes filled the air. The dew was dripping, while the first strong rays of light fell on a world in which Elnora worshipped. When the basket was filled to overflowing, she set it in the stout pasteboard box, packed it solid with mosses, tied it firmly and slipped under the cord a note she had written the previous night. Then she took a short cut across the woods and walked swiftly to Onabasha. It was after six o'clock. But all of the cities she wished to avoid were asleep. She had no trouble in finding a small boy out, and she stood at a distance waiting while he rang Dr. Ammon's bell and delivered the package for Philip to a maid, with a note which was to be given him at once. On the way home through the woods, passing some baited trees, she collected the captive moths. She entered the kitchen with him so naturally that Mrs. Comstock made no comment. After breakfast, Elnora went to her room, cleared away all trace of the night's work, and was out in the arbor mounting moths when Philip came down the road. "'I am tired sitting,' she said to her mother. "'I think I will walk a few rods and meet him.' "'Who's a trump?' he called from afar. "'Not you,' retorted Elnora. "'Confess that you forgot.' "'Completely!' said Philip, but luckily it would not have been fatal. 
I wrote Polly last week to send Edith something appropriate today, with my card. But that touch from the woods will be very effective. Thank you more than I can say. Aunt Anne and I unpacked it to see the basket, and it was a beauty. She says that you are always doing such things. Well, I hope not, laughed Elnora. If you'd seen me sneaking out before dawn, not to awaken Mother, and coming in with moths to make her think I'd been to the trees, you'd know it was a most especial occasion. Then Philip understood two things. Elnora's mother did not know of the early morning trip to the city, and the girl had come to meet him to tell him so. You are a brick to do it, he whispered as he closed the gate behind them. I'll never forget you for it. Thank you ever so much. I did not do that for you, said Elnora tersely. I did it mostly to preserve my own self-respect. I saw you were forgetting. If I did it for anything besides that, I did it for her. Just look what I've brought, said Philip, entering the arbor and greeting Mrs. Comstock. Borrowed of the bird woman, and it isn't hers. A rare edition of Catasola with colored plates. I told her the best I could, and she said to try for Sappho here. I suspect the bird woman will be out presently. She was all excitement. And they bent over the book together, and with a mounted moth before them, determined her family. The bird woman did come later, and carried the moth away, to put into a book, and Elnor and Philip were freshly filled with enthusiasm. So these days were the beginning of the weeks that followed, six of them flying on time's wings, each filled to the brim with interest. After June the moth hunts grew less frequent. The fields and woods were searched for material for Elnora's grade work. The most absorbing occupation they found was in carrying out Mrs. Comstock's suggestion to learn the vital thing for which each month was distinctive, and make that the key to the nature work. They wrote a list of the months, opposite each the things all of them could suggest which seemed to pertain to that month alone, and then tried to sift until they found something typical. Mrs. Comstock was a great help. Her mother had been Dutch, and had brought from Holland numerous quaint sayings and superstitions, easily traceable to Pliny's natural history, and in Mrs. Comstock's early years in Ohio she had heard much Indian talk among her elders, so she knew the signs of each season, and sometimes they helped. Always her practical thought and sterling common sense were useful. When they were afield until exhausted, they came back to the cabin for food to prepare specimens and classify them, and to talk over the day. Sometimes Philip brought books and read while Elnora and her mother worked, and every night Mrs. Comstock asked for the violin. Her perfect hunger for music was sufficient evidence of how she had suffered without it. So the days crept by, golden, filled with useful work and pure pleasure. The crossbeak had led the family and the maple abroad in a second brood, and a wild grapevine clambering over the well was almost ready for flight. The dust lay thick on the country roads. The days grew warmer. Summer was just poising to slip into fall, and Philip remained, coming each day as if he had belonged there always. One warm August afternoon, Mrs. Comstock looked up from the gruffle on which she was engaged to see a blue-coated messenger enter the gate. "'Is Philip Ammon here?' asked the boy. "'He is,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'I have a message for him. "'He's in the woods back of the cabin. "'I will ring the bell. "'Do you know if it is important?' "'Urgent,' said the boy. I rode hard. Mrs. Comstock stepped to the back door and clanged the dinner bell sharply, paused a second, and he rang again. In a short time Philip and Elnora ran down the path. "'Are you ill, mother?' cried Elnora. Mrs. Comstock indicated the boy. "'There is an important message for Philip,' she said. He muttered an excuse and tore open the telegram. His color faded slightly. "'I have to take the first train,' he said. "'My father is ill, and I am needed.' 
he handed the sheet to Elnora. I have about two hours, as I remember the trains north, but my things are all over Uncle Doc's house, so I must go at once. Certainly, said Elnora, giving back the message. Is there anything I can do to help? Mother, bring Philip a glass of buttermilk to start on. I will gather what you have here. Never mind, there is nothing of importance. I don't want to be hampered. I'll send for it if I miss anything I need. Philip drank the milk, said good-bye to Mrs. Comstock, thanked her for all her kindness, and turned to Elnora. Will you walk to the edge of the limber lost with me? he asked. Elnora assented. Mrs. Comstock followed to the gate, urged him to come again soon, and repeated her good-bye. Then she went back to the arbor to await Elnora's return. As she watched down the road, she smiled softly. I had an idea he would speak to me first, she thought, but this may change things some. He hasn't time. Elnora will come back a happy girl, and she is good reason. He is a model young man. Her lot will be very different from mine. She picked up her embroidery and began setting dainty, precise little stitches, possible only to certain women. On the road, Elnora spoke first. I do hope it is nothing serious, she said. Is he usually strong? Quite strong, said Philip. I am not at all alarmed, but I am very much ashamed. I have been well enough the past month to have gone home and helped him with some critical cases that were keeping him at work in his heat. I was enjoying myself, so I wouldn't offer to go. He would not ask me to come, so long as he could help it. I have allowed him to overtax himself until he is down, and Mother and Polly are north at our cottage. He's never been sick before, and it's probable I am to blame that he is now. He intended you to stay this long when you came, urged Elnora. Yes, but it's hot in Chicago. I should have remembered him. He is always thinking of me. Possibly he has needed me for days. I am ashamed to go to him in splendid condition and admit that I was having such a fine time I forgot to come home. You have had a fine time, then? asked Elnora. They had reached the fence. Philip vaulted over to take a shortcut across the fields. He turned and looked at her. The best, the sweetest, and the most wholesome time any man ever had in this world, he said. Elnor, if I talked hours I couldn't make you understand what a girl I think you are. I never in all my life hated anything, as I hate leaving you. It seems to me that I have not strength to do it. If you have learned anything worth while from me, Said Elnora, that should be it. Just to have strength to go to your duty and to go quickly. He caught the hand that she held out to him in both his. Elnora, these days we have had together, have they been sweet to you? Beautiful days, said Elnora, each like a perfect dream to be thought over and over all my life. Oh, they have been the only really happy days I have ever known. These days you're rich with mother's love and doing useful work with your help. Goodbye. You must hurry. Philip gazed at her. He tried to drop her hand, only clutched it closer. Suddenly he drew her toward him. Elnora, he whispered, will you kiss me goodbye? Elnora drew back and stared at him with wide eyes. I'd strike you sooner, she said. Have I ever said or done anything in your presence that made you feel free to ask that, Philip Hammond? No, panted Philip. No, I think so much of you I wanted to touch your lips once before I left you. You know well, Nora. Don't distress yourself, said Elnora calmly. I am broad enough to judge you sanely. I know what you mean. It would be no harm to you. It would not matter to me. 
but here we will think of someone else. Edith Carr would not want your lips tomorrow if she knew they had touched mine today. I was wise to say, go quickly. Philip still clung to her. Will you write me? he begged. No, said Elnora. There is nothing to say, save goodbye. We can do that now. He held on. Promise me that you will write me only one letter, he urged. I want just one message from you to lock on my desk and keep always. Promise you will write once, Elnora. She looked into his eyes and smiled serenely. If the talking trees tell me this winter the secret of how a man may grow perfect, I will write you what it is, Philip. In all the time I have known you, I never have liked you so little. Goodbye. She drew away her hand and swiftly turned back to the road. Philip Ammon, wordless, started toward Onabash on a run. Elnora crossed the road, climbed the fence, and sought the shelter of their own woods. She chose a diagonal course and followed it until she came to the path leading past the violet patch. She went down this hurriedly. Her hands were clenched at her side, her eyes dry and bright, her cheeks red flushed, and her breath coming fast. When she reached the patch, she turned into it and stood looking round her. The mosses were dry, the flowers gone, weeds a foot high covered it. She turned away and went on down the path till she was almost inside of the cabin. Mrs. Comstock smiled and waited in the arbor till it occurred to her that Elnora was a long time coming. So she went to the gate. The road stretched away toward the limber lost empty and lonely. Then she knew that Elnora had gone into their own woods and would come in the back way. She could not understand why the girl did not hurry to her with what she would have to tell. She went out and wandered around the garden. Then she stepped into the path and started along the way leading to the woods, past the pool now framed in a thick setting of yellow lilies. Then she saw and stopped, gasping for breath. Her hands flew up and her lined face grew ghastly. She stared at the sky and at the prostrate girl figure. Over and over again she tried to speak, but only a dry breath came. She turned and fled back to the garden. In the familiar enclosure she gazed around her like a caged animal seeking escape. The sun beat down on her bare head mercilessly, and mechanically she moved to the shade of a half-grown hickory tree that voluntarily had sprouted beside the milk house. At her feet lay an axe with which she made kindlings for fires. She stooped and picked it up. The memory of that prone figure sobbing in the grass caught her with a renewed spasm. She shut her eyes as if to close it out. That made hearing so acute she felt certain she heard old Nora moaning beside the path. The eyes flew open. He looked straight at a few spindling tomato plants set too near the tree and stunted by its shade. Mrs. Comstock whirled on the hickory and swung the axe. Her hair shook down, her clothing became disarranged, and the heat the perspiration streamed, but stroke fell on stroke until the tree crashed over, grazing a corner of the milk house and smashing the garden fence on the east. At the sound, Elnora sprang to her feet and came running down the garden walk. Mother, she cried, Mother, what in the world are you doing? Mrs. Comstock wiped her ghastly face on her apron. I've let out to cut that tree for years, she said. It shades the beets in the morning and the tomatoes in the afternoon. Elnora uttered one wild cry and fled into her mother's arms. Oh, mother, she sobbed, will you ever forgive me? Mrs. Comstock's arms swept together in a tight grip around Elnora. There isn't a thing on God's footstool from A to Z that I wouldn't forgive you, my precious girl, she said. 
Tell mother what it is. Alnora lifted her wet face. He told me, she panted, just as soon as he decently could. That second day he told me. Almost all his life he's been engaged to a girl at home. He never cared anything about me. He was only interested in the moths and growing strong. Mrs. Comstock's arms tightened. With a shaking hand she stroked the bright hair. Tell me, honey, she said. Is he to blame for a single one of these tears? Not one, sobbed Elnora. Oh, mother, I won't forgive you if you don't believe that. Not one. He never said or looked or did anything all the world might not have known. He likes me very much as a friend. He hated to go dreadfully. Elnora, the mother's head bent until the white hair mingled with the brown. Elnora, why didn't you tell me at first? Elnora caught her breath in a sharp snatch. I know I should, she sobbed. I will bear any punishment for not, but I didn't feel as if I possibly could. I was afraid. Afraid of what? The shaking hand was on the hair again. Afraid you won't let him come, panted Elnora. And, oh, mother, I wanted him so. End of chapter 17